so much for joining us uh, for GMAT Club's MBA Spotlight. Uh, we are so excited today to have Danielle Spence from the Rotman School of Management up in Toronto here with us. Um, I actually had the pleasure of visiting Rotman a few years ago. You guys actually hosted the AGAC Admissions Consultants uh, Conference. Uh, and so I think that was about three years ago. And so I actually had the pleasure of getting to know your, your campus and your program firsthand. But I am excited that people today on this webinar will be able to learn more about it themselves. Uh, so super quick. Who am I? My name is Maria Wickvila. I'm the founder of applicantlab.com, the low cost 24 7 DIY alternative to expensive admissions consulting. Uh, and now we've got Danielle Spence here. Uh, and she, Danielle, if you want to start sharing your screen, we will yeah. get moving. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. All right, everyone. So thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure um, to help you learn more about the Rotman full-time MBA at the University of Toronto. My name is Danielle Spence, as I was previously introduced by Maria, and I'm the Assistant Director in Recruitment and Admissions for Rotman School of Management. I have the pleasure of usually traveling around the world uh, to speak with talented candidates, like hopefully the ones who have tuned in today. Uh, but we are obviously in a, in a time of transition and um, we'll do the best today, speaking virtually and online altogether. As you all know that choosing an MBA is perhaps one of the most important decisions you will make both personally and professionally. So it is important that you find the right fit. Events like this are fantastic for students who are, con are considering an MBA because it does give you a feel for the school and the program to which you're applying. The goal of my presentation today is to equip you with enough information to help you decide if Rotman offers you what you want and what you need in an MBA program. We've got a lot to cover today, and I, I have about 15 minutes to speak with all of you before we jump into FAQs. So I think the best place to start is with our location, as this is one of the biggest differentiators in choosing a business school. Not only is the city important, but so is the location of the school within that city. As I'm sure many of you know, Toronto is now considered the world's most multicultural city. We are consistently ranked as one of the most livable cities in the world, a top 10 best place to live as per The Economist, and number three in terms of global cities of opportunity as ranked by PwC Cities of Opportunity. We are the second largest financial center in North America after New York, and Rotman's campus is located just steps from our business district, which is called Bay Street. Furthermore, we have over 800,000 businesses located in the greater Toronto area and 38% of Canada's business headquarters are in Toronto. We're the third largest tech center in North America after Silicon Valley and New York City. And we're home to many top, top firms and industries in the GTA. The GTA, by the way, is the greater Toronto area for those of you who don't necessarily know. At Rotman, our proximity to the downtown core gives our students a competitive edge with convenient opportunities to pop downtown to meet with top employers, senior executives, and recruiters. Here's a sampling of some of the employers that hired Rotman students last year. Perhaps one of these companies is on your dream list of employers. Our campus is not only located near the head offices of several major companies, but we are also near the University Health Network, which is Canada's largest such research organization. Also boarding the U of T campus is the Mars Discovery District. This is the largest innovation hub in North America and supports over 1,200 startups. The University of Toronto, of which Rotman is a part, is a world-class university. We rank number one in Canada, number 18 in the world, and number six um, outside of the US for worldwide universities. We have a long history of graduating Nobel laureates, prime ministers, and thought leaders. U of T has over half a million alumni scattered all over the world, and every year more than 80,000 students call U of T home. We have faculty members who are not only star researchers, but also have impressive real world experience. 
Our program at Rotman consists of 16 months of academic study with the opportunity for a four month paid internship in your second year. We offer 15 different specializations. You'll see them all listed to the right of my screen. Uh, there quite literally is something for everyone. Alternatively, you can choose a number of different courses from our over 100 electives to create your own educational experience during the MBA. The internship is an important part of a two-year MBA program because it does allow our students to test out a new career or job function to see if it's right for them. This is especially relevant for our career changers as the internship increases your chances of getting hired by exposing you to recruiters and new networks. One of our more unique majors is the specialization in business design or design thinking. Rotman is the only school in Canada to offer this specialization. Business design is the integration of customer empathy, experience design, and business strategy. We teach students how to handle complex business challenges using business design, which is a human-centered, creative problem-solving methodology. Essentially, you're taught how to design a toolkit that will help you creatively solve a plethora of business challenges that you may encounter throughout your career. If there are any entrepreneurs here today, you'll want to take note of our Creative Destruction Lab, the world's fastest growing venture lab. Here, our students gain unprecedented access to learn about entrepreneurialism and innovation from some of Canada's most successful entrepreneurs. Founded in 2012, the Creative Destruction Lab has created over $4 billion in equity value to date. When considering an MBA, you also want to think about how you can customize your experience. You can do so with the Rotman MBA by joining any one of our international programs, like an international study tour, global practicums, or exchanges. We offer 24 exchanges, sorry, we have 24 exchange partners in 17 different countries internationally. So again, there really is something for everyone. Perhaps some of you have heard of John Byrne. He's the editor of Poets and Quants, which is a very popular blog based out of the US. And he's also the founder of the Business Week rankings. John has identified Rotman as having the most comprehensive self-development initiative out of any business school currently. John was referring to our self-development lab, which is directed by a Harvard-trained personality psychologist and a former McKinsey consultant, both who are experts in leadership development. The modules of the self-development lab have been created to help students develop their communication skills, self-awareness, leadership skills, and interpersonal skills, all of which will help you find success in relationships and in teams after you graduate. The two-year MBA allows you time to work on various facets of your profile. In your second year, you have the opportunity to join the Graduate Business Council, take on a leadership role in one of our many clubs, mentor first-year students, or give back and make a difference. We have over 35 student clubs offered at Rotman that host over 250 events per year. As I, been, as I begin to consider finishing up today, um, I think it's important to consider the types of classmates you may have at Rotman. These classmates will have just as much of an impact, if not more, on your learning than some of our faculty. As Canada's largest and most diverse business school, you will be exposed to a multitude of perspectives and viewpoints, and you will leave Rotman with a truly new way to think. This is our class profile for our class of 2021. You'll see that 42% of our incoming class is female, and the average year's work experience is about five. Our GMAT average score is a 669, and you'll see to the right of the screen the breakdown of, of that score range. We are looking for students with a high potential for academic and professional success. How we assess this is looking at four key elements to your profile. The first element is your intellectual horsepower. This is assessed by looking at your transcripts and test scores, either from a GMAT or a GRE. Bear in mind that students with CFA level three are not required to submit a GMAT or a GRE. 
We also assess your intellectual horsepower by looking at the awards and scholarships you've earned to date in your academic career. The second area we look at is your experience and impact. This is assessed by looking at your ideally one page CV, your community involvement, leadership activities, and hearing from two professional references. Your communication and presence is assessed by online, timed and spontaneous video question and answers. There are two video components and one written component that are all completed on our online platform. These uh, elements only take about 25 minutes to complete. So it is um, short and sweet for those of you who aren't, aren't keen on spending too much time online being assessed. Uh, and it's all pre-recorded. You're not live with our team, although your answers are spontaneous and on the spot. The other way we assess your communication and presence is through our admissions interview. You will be interviewed by invitation only by a member of our team to learn a little bit more about your professional experience to date. Finally, we assess your spike factor. This is assessed by a, an entrance essay that is a thousand words or less. What we're looking for in this entrance essay is demonstrated resilience, perseverance, goal setting, um, things that have really shaped your character to date. Students will typically discuss their contributions to the arts or athletics, any academic or professional accomplishments of which they're particularly proud. Sometimes they'll talk about hobbies and other times they'll talk about adversity they've overcome in their lives. This spike factor essay really does give you an opportunity to teach us more and inform us about your life experiences to date outside of the quantitative elements of your transcripts and your standardized test scores. Another benefit of attending a large school like Rotman is of course the lifelong professional network to which you will have access. When you graduate, you will be joining more than 15,000 alumni who are making a difference in over 90 countries around the world. You simultaneously have access to a large instantaneous network, but you also get a small class experience because our cohort every year is split into four equal classes of 70 students. Of course, the most important element of an MBA for a lot of students is your career outcomes. Rotman is number one in Canada for employability as ranked by the Financial Times in 2019. 90% of our students are employed in meaningful employment within one year of graduation. And for all of our international students who are tuning in today, you are all entitled to a three year work permit uh, to remain in Canada and work and build that network that you started when you were a Rotman student. Our full-time employment stats are listed here. This is something that is very interesting, obviously very interesting to our incoming students. It's also something to consider when you're looking at the cost uh, benefit of completing an MBA program. Now, as I wrap up, I really am hopeful that this presentation has helped you decide if you want to pursue a degree at Rotman. If so, we can connect at a later date. I will be emailing um, the list of applicants today. Next steps would be uh, considering your submission according to our next submission deadlines. We have just passed our round one deadline, which was October 5th. Our round two deadline is upcoming January 11th, 2021. Something to bear in mind when you are thinking about your application submission is certainly um, the timing of your submission. We always encourage students to apply as soon as possible within any application cycle. We assess applications on a rolling basis. So you really should apply when you're ready versus waiting for an application deadline. I hope this presentation has helped you all today and I'm looking forward to the question and answer period that we're about to start. So thank you for your attention for this portion. All right. Thank you uh, so much, Danielle. Uh, so we are now going to, you can turn your camera back on, but if you don't want to be on camera, oh, perfect. I was going to say, if you I'm don't here. want to be on camera, that's fine. <laughs>
Uh, no problem. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that excellent overview of Rotman's programs and the admissions process. As you can imagine, we've got a ton of questions. Uh, and so we are gonna cycle through those right now. Um, there are rumors flying, and some schools have in fact confirmed this, that because of the current economic situation, COVID, et cetera, that applications to business schools are up. Uh, can you confirm, is this true for Rotman? And if so, can you give us a rough ballpark of what you're seeing so far? Yeah, so um, at Rotman, it, we are a, a big team. We've got a number of assistant directors who are broken down into regional portfolios. So um, we communicate every week and what I'm hearing Hearing from my colleagues is is mimicked in my own portfolio, and that is uh, that we have seen a big increase in applications. Um, a lot of students were under the impression that Rotman had deferred offers of admission this year as a result of COVID. That actually didn't happen. Um, we decided not to do deferrals because that seemed unfair to our students who are applying for the class of 2023. Um, but we have seen a market increase in applications for the round one deadline. I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, obviously, it's an interesting time to go back to school and engage in a full time program. I think that's one of the reasons. But the second reason, at least in my own portfolio, would be that processing times are taking so much longer for international students that I think a lot of international students are giving themselves the longest runway possible so that they're not um, impacted out of their control with delays in study permit processing and obtaining visas. Um, that's an excellent you know, point. And I, that's a perfect segue for a question I was going to ask later, but I'll ask it now. Uh, you did touch upon this briefly, uh, but for those people who may not be familiar with, you know, because here in the US, uh, especially depending on the election, uh, things may or may not be international friendly, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. in the coming years. And so I think that one of the biggest advantages, you know, if I were in the shoes of many applicants today, I would be strongly considering going to Canada uh, for my MBA program. And so could you, could you maybe dig a little bit more into like, how does the visa process work if someone is interested in residency and moving to Canada uh, mm -hmm. after their MBA? Is that something that's feasible? Or is it like, you know, a lottery uh, system? Because I think this is something that really helps set the Canadian programs apart. Yeah, so we are a country built on immigration and we have a very healthy, very welcoming immigration system in Canada. Um, every international student completing a two year MBA, and I, I stress two year because there is a bit of a difference. I'm speaking for Rotman's program specifically. You'll have to do a bit of research on shorter MBA programs. But for a two year MBA, you are automatically entitled to a three year work permit. How that works beyond the three years does depend a little bit on the candidate, but generally speaking, if you have worked for three years in Canada and attended school for two years in Canada, there is a, it's not a point system per se, but there is a bit of an assessment on how long you have been in country then being entitled for permanent residency status. Um, so the vast majority of our international students who wish to stay and remain in Canada, that is made possible because they have two years of education with three years of working in country, which then makes them eligible for permanent residency. Oh, that's a really great point because some of the other programs in Canada are actually one year MBA programs, which have their own pros and cons, but it sounds like there's also perhaps a potential draw or potential benefit, I should say, to Rotman's program being two years, uh, therefore giving people more options in terms of- There's a bit of a difference, you're right, yeah. yeah. And I'm not an immigration professional, so yeah, uh, certainly, I. yeah. This is this is anecdotal from my experience. I would anyone who's really set on on the permanent residency route should be doing their research as well. Yeah, so I get a lot of those questions too, and I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> I got enough on my plate. <laughs> to think about. Um, I cannot be an expert on this sort of thing as well. But so I, you certainly just helped me understand a lot more than I had before. So thank you. Well, I'm glad. Good. <laughs> Yay. Um, okay. So in the application pool, uh, I think more people may be unemployed than perhaps they have been in, uh, in the past. Um, oh, sorry. That, that perhaps they have been in the past. So uh, if people are applying right now and they're unemployed, how are you guys assessing that or judging those folks? 
We, we have discussed this within our team and there definitely have been a lot of COVID related, related rather layoffs and furloughs both domestically and internationally. Um, we're not going to hold uh, world events <laughs> against our applicants. Um, what, what I would stress, if you are experiencing a period of unemployment due to COVID, um, I would try to put yourself in our shoes and, and give us a bit of an understanding of how you've been filling your time otherwise. So whilst we wouldn't um, look unfavorably at an applicant who has experienced a period of unemployment due to COVID, it is always good to show that you're somehow engaged, um, whether that's in an entrepreneurial venture or leveling up or perhaps even helping out with a family business, whatever it may be, um, volunteering. If you could fill in that gap for us, that would be the absolute best approach. Um, but it is hard to fill in gaps when people are under lockdown. <laughs> so take it all with a grain of salt, do your best, um, think about how that's going to have an impact on the overall appearance of your profile. But we are seeing a lot of individuals who have unfortunately experienced layoffs and furlough because of COVID and, and we're not um, treating them really any differently than those who have been able to maintain their jobs. That's, that's great to hear. And as I, I pointed out, for those of you who have been with us for the past several hours, I pointed this out during another Q&A. Uh, you know, one of the admissions officers at a top business school said over the summer, like, that she got on it. She got laid off from a job yeah. in a previous part of her life. So she is certainly not going to hold that against anyone. And I think it's fair to say that most admissions officers are real people, too. Uh, and they will, of course, be understanding and empathetic should you find yourself in this situation. Um, all right. So jumping into, uh, you know, GMAT Club has over 1 million registered users. There are over 10,000 people who signed up for uh, to, partic you know, to get information about this session. Uh, and so there's a lot of people from India uh, who are especially interested in Rotman. So because you get so many Indian applicants and because so many of them have very similar backgrounds, can you give us any information at all about how do you differentiate what can help differentiate the very similar applicants? That's a good question. And it's um, very relevant to me because as some of those who are tuning in probably already know that I manage our India portfolio um, in conjunction with the rest of South Asia and the Middle East. Um, so there are a lot of profiles coming out of India that are similar. Um, I think it's worthwhile uh, thinking about the fact that we do take a holistic approach to admissions. So believe it or not, I am looking at every single application that comes through to Rotman from India. So I have a good grasp of the sorts of candidates that we're able to admit to the program every year um, and the sorts of candidates that don't necessarily make it through. A common misconception amongst Indian candidates is that the GMAT is the be all and end all of the application. Um, Indian candidates are very well versed in standardized testing because of uh, the way that the education system is formatted in India. So by and large, Indian candidates do very well on the GMAT. Um, so if we're looking at a pool of very similar applicants, rather than spending time rewriting the GMAT to get a 760, Stick with your 700 GMAT would be my advice and think about the holistic approach to the application. Um, what are your video submissions like? What are you talking about in your spike factor essay? Um, what kind of recommendations do you think you're getting from your recommenders? There are ways to stand out. The best way to stand out is to demonstrate strength in every area of the application. Hopefully that answers the question a little bit, but uh, a tunnel vision approach to standardized testing is a theme that I do see in a very competitive, very large portfolio. Um, I would always recommend spending more time on expressing yourself uh, properly in your videos and in your essay and being a little more thoughtful about those components than um, expending time and resources on rewriting the GMAT for a few GMAT points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and that's a, that's a great point. I mean, something I, I bring up to people all the time is that business schools are looking for people who are going to go on to become business leaders. Uh, and so what defines a business leader? You know, I often talk about, I give an example of my husband's career, which he hates. Uh, but, you know, he was in finance earlier in his career. And, in, and 20 years ago, what made him successful was being very, very good at Excel and numbers and analysis. And now that he's a senior executive, it's not about that at all, right? He has people who do that stuff for him and it is almost entirely about his people skills. Uh, and so I think that a lot of candidates, especially from India, you know, it's important to realize that they're looking for people skills so that when you graduate from Rotman and then you, you, you know, go out into the world and do great things, that you have those people skills that will elevate you uh, to that level. So I, I'm glad to hear you. I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, so a related question that uh, you may or may not be able to address is, speaking of being obsessed with GMAT scores, um, <laughs> do, do Indian candidates tend to have higher than average scores? People who get accepted, I would say, tend to have higher than average GMAT scores versus people perhaps from Canada or the United States. Yeah, and that is a good question. And it is a question worth exploring a little bit. Um, Firstly, the way that our team is organized is to ensure that candidates aren't being treated differently because I am exclusively looking at South Asian and Middle Eastern candidates. So there is kind of, um, I'm not working with blinders on because there is collaboration between our different portfolio uh, managers or assistant directors in our recruitment and admissions team, but I am comparing Indian applicants to Indian applicants. Um, so, this bit of concern that the GMAT is treated differently with Indians is, is not really applicable because I am looking almost exclusively at Indian applications. Um, the Indian GMAT scores do tend to be higher globally than other nations, but there's a lot of different reasons for this. First off, as I already touched upon, um, the standardized testing that is part of uh, the Indian education system from a very young age makes Indian test takers uh, usually quite quite a bit better versed when taking a standardized test and attempting a standardized test. The second thing to consider is that Indian nationals by and large are instructed in English as well. So they're not dealing with English as a second language as a bit of a hurdle when trying to attempt the GMAT. So the GMAT scores do tend to trend higher. That said, I every year <laughs> decline um, Indian candidates with 760, 770 GMATs. I've done it. Getting back to that holistic approach to admissions. Um, and every year Indian candidates get into the program with GMATs in the 600 range. So there's no hard and fast rules on it. That would be grossly unfair. Um, and unjust in the process for assessing applicants, whether they're Indian or other foreign nationals. Um, but I will say this, the GMAT score is one element of your application that you are almost entirely in control of in the present and in the now. So if your GPA does not necessarily make you an impressive candidate, you do need to focus on the GMAT uh, because it is something that you can uh, control. We will only look at your highest GMAT score. So if you need to attempt it a few times, if you feel you're more competitive, a good guideline is to aim for the 700 threshold for Indian applicants, for all applicants. Um, in my presentation, you would have seen that our average GMAT last year was a 669. So let's call it a 670. Um, that is trending higher. So it doesn't matter where you're coming from in the world, uh, be thoughtful about this type of application you're submitting and just try your hardest to demonstrate strength in all areas. I feel like that was a really circular answer to the question, but I hope no, that's you actually the <laughs> You answered it, you answered it completely because you, you said yes, they there does tend to be a higher than average, but that having been said, it doesn't mean that just because your score is in the 600s that you're doomed and you shouldn't even bother uh, because of the, thankfully, the holistic nature of of this process, you know, re rejecting people with 760s or 780s makes a ton of sense because showing that you're really, really good at taking a test might not mean anything in terms of your ability to lead and inspire others. So I would like to bring that up for people who are watching right now. We're <laughs> like, I have a 780. That means I'm guaranteed admission to 100% of my school. It absolutely schools. does not. No. Yeah. Um, okay. So I, I noticed on your slide about your, your class profile, you've got a pretty big 
uh, work experience range in terms of your admitted class. You have between people are, are, are enrolling with between zero to 13 years of experience. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a pretty big range. And so I was wondering, um, because we, we tend to get a lot of questions as well in terms of like, am I too old? Am I too young? Uh, for, for either end of that spectrum, the zero years or the 13 years, if someone is very young, we'll start with the young people, how can someone who's very early in their career assess if they're ready to be a competitive candidate? How can they, if they're like one or two years out or zero years out, how can they start thinking about like, huh, I should probably apply this year or hmm, might, you know, might be a little early, might wanna wait a few years. How would you advise someone in that situation? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are benefits to both being on the younger end of the spectrum or the older end of the spectrum. I shy away from saying young or old because it really is about years of work experience. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> uh, but it is about years work experience. So sorry, I've just lost a headphone. Um, so there will be individuals on our program who have graduated from their bachelor's degree 10, 15 years ago, occasionally, because they've actually had to take some time out of the workforce. Um, it happens with uh, some of our applicants who have had families. Um, they've had different commitments that have required their time, and they've had a few pauses or breaks in their career trajectory. I think for young candidates, um, there are a few things to bear in mind. So firstly, there are advantages to being young on the program that a lot of our uh, less experienced, more junior potential candidates don't consider. So firstly, with being more on the junior side, you're going to learn a lot from your classmates and colleagues because you don't necessarily have as much to contribute. Um, you're going to learn certainly more from your classmates than the individuals with 10 years work experience. Secondly, we do have a compulsory internship component to the program. A more junior candidate is going to have a bigger choice with internships, not having as much experience because occasionally you can kind of experience out of being competitive for internships, which I'll get to when I talk about our more experienced candidates. The third thing that our younger and less experienced candidates seem to forget is they've only been out of formalized education for a couple of years. It can be a really big transition to move back into full-time education after having been in the workforce. So they are a little more malleable and they adapt a little easier to being back in the classroom full time. We do have a minimum uh, level of work experience for our more junior candidates coming into the program and that's two years. We do have the zero years listed on our profile or our class profile rather because we have some direct entry programs. For example, for engineers coming from Ontario universities, they don't require the two year work experience as well as those doing um, MBA, uh, JD MBA programs. So law school candidates as well, they don't require the work X. Outside of those examples, we do require two years work X by date of matriculation, which we really need that highlight and asterisk on the date of matriculation. So um, if by all, you're considering applying now, you have one year work experience, we would consider you to have two years work experience uh, to join the class in August, 2021. Um, whether you decide to join or not, once you hit that two year threshold, it really does have to do with why you want to complete the MBA. If you're looking to skyrocket ahead and skip a couple steps in your career trajectory, that's great. But bear in mind that very few businesses want a VP who's only got four years work experience. Um, be realistic on what your post MBA goals are and the opportunities afforded you by the MBA. You're probably only going to do one MBA in your lifetime. So you really need to be ready professionally to take advantage of all the opportunities available to you through the program. Now, I'm talking a lot, sorry. On the opposite end of the spectrum is the more experienced candidates. Um, our more experienced candidates are always superstars in the program. They always do really well. They tend to take on leadership uh, roles within the program. They tend to stand out within the program. Uh, if you're a more mature student and you're considering the MBA, I think, again, you have to go back to what you're hoping to do with the MBA. If it's a career pivot, that two-year MBA might be just what you need to legitimize a pivot in your career at a slightly later date within your career. 
Uh, some things to bear in mind that are challenges occasionally by our more mature candidates are the internship, where our young candidates have kind of all the opportunities and options in the internship. Our more experienced candidates can sometimes be too experienced for a lot of the internship opportunities. We will have uh, quite frank discussions with our students with more than usually eight or nine years work experience is considered more experienced on the program. Um, they need to be self-directed when it comes to uh, obtaining the internship. Uh, it will be a little bit more challenging because there won't be as much opportunity for someone with their level of work experience. Um, beyond that, again, it goes back to that holistic approach and just looking for strong individuals who are well-rounded. So um, for young candidates, if you are a fresh graduate who graduated six months ago, I would say maybe press pause on your MBA aspirations for six to 12 months. For our candidates with more than eight years work experience, going between eight and 10 years work experience, maybe have a discussion with a member of our team before submitting an application because there might be an MBA offering that is more aligned to your goals and your needs. We do have different MBA programs at Rotman. It's not just the full time. And that's a, that's a great point. You know, sometimes I, I talk to people who are on the more experienced side and uh, they say, well, it's not fair that I, you know, the admissions process, it's harder to get in. It's not fair. And I say, well, it's, you know, if you want to work in management consulting or investment banking, it may be harder for you to get those post MBA level jobs. And so some people will say, well, that's not fair. And I'm like, well, think about that. Like if you go in as an associate level at Bain or whatever, like your boss is going to be maybe 10 years younger than you are. And are you going to be cool with that? And your colleagues are all going to be 10 years younger than you are. And they will work 100 hours a week because they may not have as many uh, personal requirements or, or commitments as you do. So really think about, I would urge everyone in general to think about what are your career goals with an MBA, but especially the older the older candidates. Like it's easy to think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence and, oh God, I just need to get that job in banking. Uh, but really think about like, what would it be like for you to work a hundred hours a week reporting to someone who is considerably younger than you? Would you be cool with that? Uh, if you look at yourself, honestly, you may think, no, not really. <laughs> once you, once you stop and, uh, once you stop and think about it. Yeah. Um, Okay, so a couple of questions about the program, some more sort of specific uh, tactical questions. Can you have multiple concentrations? That's a that's a good question. I get that one a lot. Um, if you want to concentrate on multiple areas, I would almost always recommend that you enroll in a general MBA because then you have different opportunities to enroll in any electives that you're interested in. Um, with a specialization, the list of elective courses is narrowed quite a bit to ensure that you're meeting the criteria for that specialization. So if a few different things interest you, I would always recommend moving forward with a general MBA and picking and choosing the exact um, electives that are interesting to you. Okay. Um, someone wants to know, have you guys been working more to develop uh, offerings in op fields of like operations and digital? So in terms of like course offerings or course offerings yeah. so um the curriculum has changed a little bit during COVID. i don't know if this is COVID related or not but um we do i think it's just in general just in general so we do have specializations in operations management we do have elective courses in uh the digital space. Um, sorry, without more elaboration yeah. on that question, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. Well, I think, I think you know, I would the Creative Destruction Lab, I think, is something that really uh, sets you guys apart. It really is a great way for those of you who might be watching this who are interested in learning about design thinking. Uh, it is a real hands-on way uh, that Robin teaches design thinking. So... I would look at that. And also, can you describe a little bit more about, this is actually, this is not a question I got from the crowd. This is a question I want you to elaborate on because I was so impressed when I visited. Uh, the self-development lab, you know, the I don't remember the woman's name who runs it. but Maya they were, Bajic. Yes. <laughs> yes. She was amazing. She was so inspirational. And it's not just that she individually was inspirational, but what she was building out. If I recall correctly, there were elements of the program where you get like video recorded and your, your, 
face and your body language and all that gets assessed, which the idea of it stresses me out, but also is so <laughs> useful, right? I mean, there are so many micro elements of how we come across that impact how we're perceived. So could you could you talk a, a little bit more about, you know, when did the self-development lab start? What are what are some of the highlights of it? What's the reception been from the student body? Because I think it's a yeah, great Yeah, so self-development lab, not... Um, not to take away from the other programming that we have at Rotman, but it definitely is one of our flagship opportunities within the within the program and something that we are very well known for. Um, Self-development lab is one of the softer elements of a profile and some additional work that can be done outside of the basic criteria to earn an MBA that's accredited internationally. So it really is a benefit of a two-year MBA because you do have the quote unquote luxury of time to work on other parts of your profile aside from getting your managerial accounting, et cetera. Um, the self-development lab was developed by Dr. Maya Bajic. She is phenomenal. Um, if you ever have the opportunity or the pleasure to see even a video recording of, of Maya, it translates through video. Uh, let alone in person, her charisma and her magnetism is is amazing. Um, the I don't I think some of it is maybe she was born with it, but it could be all thanks to the self development lab. But she is looking to help people really make an impact and influence both um, personally and professionally. So as you right, rightly identified, there is a video component to the self-development lab. So for example, an exercise that our students always talk about is uh, practice interviews being video recorded. And then within the self-development lab, they will go through that video almost like a coach would with game tape um, for any individuals who are in the sports world and would know this reference, they will circle you know, Danielle, when you turn your head this way, when you're speaking, that could be perceived as hostile by some of your listeners. You're moving your hands too much. They shouldn't be in your lap. They should be so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and it's really great because as you, as you noted, you aren't necessarily understanding how you're being perceived. And the self-development lab does delve into that. And it's amazing how much more productive and efficient you can be when building consensus, um, solving problems, mediating disputes, negotiations, et cetera, when you've gone through the various components of the self-development lab. Uh, they have been designed for um, helping people hone in on these skills to further their interpersonal skills and their leadership skills. And as I said, really helpful professionally, but also personally as well. We've received a lot of feedback from students. It is definitely one of the most popular and sought after elements of the full-time MBA at Rotman, for sure. And and with good reason. It was it was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, on a more on a more sort of pragmatic level, uh, what's the difference between the MIM and the MBA? So the difference is basically um, scope. So the MBA with the SDL um, as just one facet of it, it is less of a specialized program and more of a broad reaching program. Uh, the full time MBA is going to be useful for individuals one year out of the program, 10 years out of the program, and 20 years out of the program in a really broad spectrum of business practice. So um, if people are looking to specialize in one specific area, that's great. But the full-time MBA does provide individuals with a well-rounded approach to leadership um, and management effectively. And and uh, does does having an MIM, how, if somebody gets an MIM and then later they apply for an MBA, does that impact, or if they already have, say, a PGP uh, degree from an Indian business institution, does that impact their admissions chances later on? It absolutely doesn't have an impact from Rotman's perspective. Um, the only area where you might find you get caught up is legitimizing a study permit. It doesn't happen frequently, but occasionally um, there will be questions as to why you are why you feel the need to get further accreditation when you've already completed something quite similar. Um, so that is something to bear in mind. But every year we have applicants coming into the program who already have MBAs from foreign countries and they're still able to obtain their study permit documents and join us at Rotman. So 
it really does depend. <laughs> so, so when somebody does already have a, some sort of a master's degree in a business or management related topic, what what reason do they have to, to get the MBA? Like that is that says that convinces you like, oh, you know what? We should this person really will benefit from our program, even though they already studied this. Yeah, so it's not so much us looking at it with a with concern or um, more questions. It's more immigration. So okay. it it would be more from an immigration perspective. Sometimes students do find that their study permit applications are refused because they've already obtained a graduate degree. Um, it usually is if it's an MBA. Again, it's it's rare, but it has happened in the past. Um, but we love to see advanced degrees with our applicants as long as they do have that work experience as well. So a professional student who has multiple degrees on end and hasn't been in the workforce isn't necessarily going to be attractive for the MBA program, but a master's degree in any field is not going to be detrimental because it does show us that you're intellectually curious and you are looking to better yourself and level up in your training and your accreditations. All right, excellent. Um, so I think those are most, pretty much most of the questions that we've gotten. Now, those of you who are in the chat who asked a question, I, uh, I did say at the beginning in the chat that I am going to focus on questions that I think are of general interest. So if you ask a question about your profile or if you asked a question also that can be answered by Google, such as, you know, some career placement stats or things like that, you know what, I think we will, uh, we'll, we'll respect Danielle's time <laughs> a little bit more. So I will ask this one final question. Someone wants to sure. know, is the minimum, is there a minimum GPA requirement? Uh, and if so, is it set in stone? Yeah, so we we do have a minimum admission requirement for the GPA, but it is not set in stone. So the minimum requirement would be a 3.0 on a four point scale. Um, anything below this is going to mean that we're taking a really close look at your undergraduate transcripts and your standardized test. So every year students do um, gain acceptance into the program with GPAs under that 3.0 threshold, but they generally speaking have quite high standardized test scores to offset that perceived weakness. Um, or we're looking at the type of degree in their undergrad and, and looking back further than the final year of undergrad or the final six senior courses. So an example of this might be um, some of our engineers and specialized programs are in very academically challenging programs. They may not have hit that minimum 3.0 and they still are uh, welcomed into the program. But it, again, I've said this a million times and I apologize, I sound like a broken record, but we do take that holistic approach. So if your GPA is low, but um, you write about a particular experience in your undergrad that maybe explains the low GPA, we're not looking for excuses in, in your essay or your CV. But for example, we have a lot of athletes who come into the program. So mm -hmm. if you're a varsity athlete and involved in X, Y, and Z clubs and your GPA was a little bit under the 3.0, that might be enough to still make you um, attractive for admission. But the 3.0 is a good threshold. And by and large, our students do hit that threshold. And for folks with a lower GPA, I would I would reemphasize what Danielle just said, the importance of the standardized test, because the standardized test is the level playing field, right? Yeah. Someone who majored in neuroscience engineering at MIT, uh, they might have below a 3.0, but in terms of, you know, hmm, can this person handle the academic rigors of our coursework? Probably a different consideration versus someone who has a 3.0 in perhaps something that is not considered to be as rigorous. So it really is, yeah. there's so many wild variations in GPA, uh, but the standardized test score, as the name standardized, <laughs> as it suggests, yeah. uh, that's your level playing field. So I would urge all of you concerned about that to really take your tests really seriously. Okay. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think we are at our the end of our time. I want to thank Danielle so much for taking the time today to talk to us about Rotman and even a little bit about the Canadian immigration process, uh, which I think folks either are interested in, and if they're not, they should be. Um, and so thanks so much for, for being here and for joining us today. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. And good luck to everyone with their research and their applications.